Hello all. Today we're going to take a look at a festive rhyme. Christmas is coming and the geese are getting fat, which, for me at least, invokes images of Dickensian London. The most famous version goes as follows. Christmas is coming, the geese are getting fat. Please put a penny in the old man's hat. If you haven't got a penny, a halfpenny will do. If you haven't got a halfpenny, then God bless you. What's the history of the rhyme? When was goose a family favourite for Christmas dinner? What was life like for a Victorian beggar? And what could an old man have bought for a penny? The theme of the rhyme is fairly self-explanatory. As Christmas approaches and our minds turn to the festivities and the opulence of a Christmas dinner, we should stop and think of those less fortunate. It plays into the charitable sensibilities of the late nineteenth century and ends with a religious sentiment that if you can't afford to give even a halfpenny, then you are at least in our prayers. The tune most commonly sung today was written by Edith Nesbitt, who interestingly is more famous as the author of *The Railway Children* and *The Treasure Seekers*. There are later versions which have additional verses talking about candles being lit and Santa coming to visit, but these were mostly written to flesh out the admittedly short original single verse and used by Hollywood crooners for Christmas albums. Let's start by looking at the reference to the goose getting fat. In England through the nineteenth century, there was no one single meat dish eaten at Christmas. Turkey had been enjoyed by the wealthy since the sixteenth century, but for poorer families, a more common option was either beef or goose. Goose was still a relatively expensive choice, and as a result, goose clubs were common. These were often organised by a pub landlord. You paid little money each week through the year, with regular updates on how plump your prospective goose was getting. Then, as Christmas approached, a day was selected when the geese were to be distributed to the members of the club. To make things fair, each person was given a ticket. A goose was selected, a ticket was drawn, and you got your goose. Hopefully, a fat one. In this picture, the lady seems rather unimpressed. Historically, and even today, millions of geese and turkeys are reared on farms in Norfolk and Suffolk, over a hundred miles northeast of London. And through the eighteenth and nineteenth century, over a hundred and fifty thousand of these were walked from the countryside to the city by drovers, droving home for Christmas. The birds apparently wore little boots to protect their feet. The most famous reference to goose being central to a Christmas dinner is in the classic novel *A Christmas Carol* by Charles Dickens, first published in 1843. And in many ways, the story of Misley Scrooge and his faithful and underpaid clerk Bob Cratchit mirrors the moral tale of the rhyme. As Bob Cratchit observes upon seeing the centerpiece of his Christmas dinner, he didn't believe that ever such a goose was cooked. Its tenderness, its flavour, size, and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Indeed, it might be argued that it was a Christmas carol which did more than anything else to switch the nation's preferences from goose to turkey. On Christmas morning, Scrooge, having been visited by the three spirits the night before, has seen the error of his ways and called on a boy in the street to go and buy the prize turkey in a poulterer's window, and later presented it to the Cratchits in part recompense for so many misdeeds. What about the old man in the rhyme whose hat we are asked to place a penny in? At a time when poverty was viewed as a result of bad individual choices and immoral behaviour, the fact the rhyme suggests we give charity to an old man is significant. The Victorians, both as a matter of law and social attitude, separated those at the bottom of society into two classes: the deserving and undeserving poor. The deserving poor included anyone placed in financial difficulties by events beyond their control, including illness and old age. The undeserving poor were seen as those who declined work, or who were viewed as idle, drunk, or with loose morals. Such people were not entitled to pity or really much consideration at all. As Scrooge observes at the start of a Christmas Carol, when asked by the men of charity to donate to the poor, are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? And when told many would rather die than go there, he responds with perhaps one of the most famous lines in the novel: "If they would rather die," said Scrooge, "then they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population." If we assume he's homeless beggar on the streets of London in the mid to late nineteenth centuries, what was his life have been like? Officially, begging was illegal under the 1824 Vagrancy Act. Some provisions of this act still exist in law in Britain today. For those guilty of begging, they could be sent to prison or to the workhouse. However, in reality, this is often at the discretion of the police and the city fathers. As well as the obvious cold of a night on the streets in the dog days of December, there was the inherent danger of being mugged for your penny. So our old man may have sought refuge in one of over one thousand doss houses across the slums of London. Beds in doss houses were cheap, especially if, as was common, you only slept in one for a few hours, and then the bed would be used by another unfortunate soul, without changing the linen. 
The alternatives to the Doss House were worse, hostels run by charities such as the Salvation Army. If he could beg enough money, our old man could have spent the night in a so-called fourpenny coffin. As the name suggests, this was little more than a wooden box with a tarpaulin cover, lined up in long rows in cold, damp warehouses. But this too was better than the cheaper option of renting a line of rope and sleeping standing up, only woken by a poke at sunrise. If our old man only managed to beg that single penny, then the last option was the penny sit-up, paying for some meagre food and a relatively warm room, but literally sitting up through the night, the only proviso being that he could not lie down. That cost extra. At the very bottom of the social rung was the workhouse. As a vagrant, our old man may have entered these institutions classed as part of the casual poor, and so might be provided with food and a bed in exchange for hard labour. Usually this was rock-breaking, or more likely, given his age, put to work unpicking old tarry-rope to create oakum. The loose fibres were used to pack the joints of wooden sailing ships. It's from this that we gain the phrase, money for old rope. If we assume that he'd been able to keep some money for himself, what could he have bought for a penny? Pre-decimal currency, which was used in Britain until 1971, was made up of pounds, shillings and pence. Without getting into the details, one pound was made up of 20 shillings. One shilling was 12 pence, thus there were 240 pence to a pound. But, I hear you cry in frustration, just tell us what he could buy for a penny. It's difficult to narrow it down exactly, but if we take 1888 and a shilling, he could have bought five loaves of bread, five pounds of sugar, 18 pounds of vegetables, three pints of beer a small sack of coal, or two packs of tobacco. He would almost certainly buy food from one of the 30,000 street sellers or costermongers. They sold everything from old toys to fish and poultry. In this picture, the boys are eating halfpenny ice, which I suppose the man could have bought, but perhaps not in December. Or he could have gone to the Muffin Man, from the Rhyme, which I can do a video about if you like. Those who begged on the streets of London were largely overlooked by the more well-to-do, which created almost two Londons. But by the 1880s, in part driven by the work of people like Dickens and other social reformers, there was a demand for change. A famous example of this was the work of Charles Booth. Booth was a Liverpool industrialist, and he was unconvinced by the estimations made in 1886 that a quarter of London's poor lived in poverty. He set about with a team of researchers to map the city. He created a survey, Life and Labour of the People, completed in 1902. This included a poverty map in which different stratas of society were given different colours. Our old man will most certainly have lived in the lowest grades, where the inhabitants were described as vicious and semi-criminal, or in the dark blue areas where the very poor and casual labourers lived in chronic want. Places like the Old Nickel became famous as an overcrowded slum where disease was rife and people lived in abject squalor. When the report was published, Booth found far from a quarter of the population living in poverty, it was actually closer to a third. So how would those who could afford to give a penny to charity come across our beggar? Late in the 1880s, London experienced a boom in so-called slum tourism. While there were those who did this for their own amusement and to tell tales of brushes of the so-called darker side of humanity, others such as Lady Battersea and the American journalist Jack London used their visits and subsequent publications to help sway public opinion about the plight of the poor, with the slums increasingly seen as a symptom of what was wrong with society. Putting a penny in the hat of the old man became part of a call to arms for change. That change was a long time coming, and only substantial reform came with the creation of the welfare state after the Second World War. Nevertheless, the idea of helping the poor remained an important theme, and this rhyme does that, reminding us to help those less fortunate than ourselves at this time of year. Well, I hope you liked this little tale. If you did, think about leaving a like or maybe a comment, and subscribe for more. Bye for now.